So our first session this morning, we're going to look at a vision for church community. And in this session, what we're going to do is we're going to look at our need for community. We're going to define what church community is, and then we're going to look at where that community comes from. And then later on today in sessions two and three, what we'll look at is really what that community uh, looks like. And then in session four, Saturday morning, we're going to look at a practical application of how we can move from here uh, back out into the real world and, uh, and actually practice the things that we're learning. So let me pray again, and then we will get started. Father, you are the Father of glory. Lord, we ask that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of who you are. Lord, give us, Lord, eyes to see, Lord, ears to hear. Lord, that we may know what is the hope to which you have called us. Lord, reveal to us what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints. Lord, what is the immeasurable greatness of your power towards us who believe? Lord, we know that it is through your Son that we can come to you now. Lord, that you have given him all things. Lord, you've made him the head over all things. But Lord, your word says that You've put all things under his feet and given him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So, Lord, as we learn more about your church now, the fullness of Christ, well, that you would bless our time together and be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. So in in classic works of literature, and in some movies, people sometimes die from extraordinary rejection or loss. Some of you guys, I know your favorite movie is The Notebook. You laugh, but I know it is. Thank you, Nick. Pride and Prejudice. So we see in these movies people dying, right, from loss, and a loved one dies, and immediately after they die. So we see people dying from from rejection and loss in these movies and in in literature. And they literally die from loneliness. Ben Sass notes that although it might be tempting to chalk these up to a literary melodrama, the American Heart Association says that death by heartbreak is in fact quite real. In broken heart syndrome, rejection and loss cause stress hormones to flood the body, mimicking the effects of a heart attack. And how common is this broken heart syndrome? Among epidemiologists, psychiatrists, public health officials, social scientists, there is growing consensus that the number one health crisis in America is not cancer, it's not obesity, it's not heart disease, it's loneliness. Doctors are sounding the alarm about what most public health experts call our loneliness epidemic. We as a culture lack community, and that lack of community is literally killing us. In the first pages of the Bible, we're given the reason why this is. In Genesis chapter 1, we see creation unfolding. And as creation unfolds, we see the phrase, and God saw that it was good. Right? We see that accompany every part of creation. And then we get to verse 31, after God creates Adam. And we read, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But then, in chapter 2, we see the phrase, it is not good that man should be alone. So why this divine declaration, it is not good, regarding God's perfect creation? Tim Keller helps us here. He says, Adam was not lonely because he was imperfect, but because he was perfect. 
The ache for friends is the one ache that is not the result of sin. This one ache that is part of his perfection. God made us in such a way that we cannot enjoy paradise without friends. God made us in such a way that we cannot enjoy our joy without human friends. Our basic condition is needing others. We need community. And so let's define what community is. Community is simply fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, or goals. That's what community is. Community can be built on any foundation. We can have great community based on all kinds of similarities. We can have community founded on similar seasons of life, similar vocations, similar passions or hobbies. People join clubs to be in community and to be around people that are like them. Something that they, they want to be with people that they have something in common with. So what kind of community does God want us to have? What kind of community does God want to see in our churches? First, we have to understand that the local church is not like joining a club. Christians don't join churches, they submit to them. When you are given the new birth, you are born into a new family, the church. When you choose Christ, you choose his people too, your brothers and your sisters. Choose the Father and the Son, and you have to choose the whole family, which you do through a local church. And in our local churches, we have two types of community that we can see. We have gospel plus community and gospel revealing community. Gospel plus community and gospel revealing community. Gospel plus community is where relationships are founded on the gospel plus something else. Gospel plus community says, yes, we have Christ in common, but what really brings us together, what really draws out our community, is the fact that we have the same stage of life. We educate our kids the same way. We have the same hobbies, we have the same likes or dislikes, and so on. The reason we are friends, the reason we have community, isn't ultimately because we have Jesus Christ in common, but the fact that we are the same in all these other ways. Now, of course, our church and every other church does have a certain cultural majority. Right? We all have things in common other than Christ. It's natural. Like attracts like. Right? I'm sure last night, as you guys talked, you, you realized you had other things in common. And that's a natural thing. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. We are comfortable with what's familiar, and we want to be around people that make us comfortable. But is that the foundation of our community? Are we seeking a community? Are we seeking friendships in the church with only those that are like us? Or are we seeking a community where similarity isn't necessary because we have Jesus Christ in common? And that brings us to gospel revealing community. Gospel revealing community is where our relationships exist because of the truth and the power of the gospel. Gospel revealing community is where our relationships exist because of the truth and power of the gospel. This sort of community is what Paul has in mind when he was talking about God's plan for the church in the book of Ephesians. If you guys have your Bibles, can you please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. So in Ephesians chapter 2, we get to see God's unfolding plan for the church. So Ephesians chapter 2, Paul starts with the gospel. We were dead in the, in the sins and trespasses, verse 1. But God made us alive together with Christ, verse 5. How does he make us alive? Skip ahead to verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Then, so we have Paul expanding on just exploding with the gospel message. And then, towards the end of chapter 2, 
and even into chapter 3, Paul draws out this unity that the Jew and the Gentile now share in the church in Ephesus because of the gospel. Verses 14 and 16, For he himself is our peace, who made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. It's important to note here that the distinction between Jew and Gentile is far greater than any distinction or differences we will ever see in our church. The Jew and Gentile shared no common history, no ethnic, ethnic similarities, no religi religious similarities, no cultural similarities. All they had in common was a history of hatred for one another. And now... God has put to death their hostility through the death of his son. So why is Paul highlighting this unity here in the book of Ephesians? Why spend time on the unity and diversity of Jew and Gentile right after his gospel message? Why is this so significant? Because to me it seems almost like a break. He's talking about the gospel, and then now this Jew and Gentile thing. Why does he spend time here? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things. So that, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. How and why did a group of Gentiles who share nothing in common except a history of hatred for one another come together in the local church? Because of one thing they do have in common. Their bond in Christ. They live together in astonishing love and unity. Unity so unexpected, so contrary to how our world operates, that even the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms sit up and take notice. Do you see that? This is how the gospel is revealed, made known, manifested, put on display to the world. When Christ is what brings and holds us together. This sort of community is what God desires for our church. We should seek a community. We should seek friendships that have a breadth. That is, relationships that have little in common but Christ. And we should seek community that has depth. A community that doesn't just tolerate each other, but that is committed to loving and caring for one another, just as God has loved and cared for us. Just like we say the emphasis in our speech is the gospel we preach, the emphasis in our community is the gospel that gets the glory. God is calling us to a community in the local church that is defined by a commitment and togetherness that we experience that transcends all natural bonds because of our commonality in Jesus Christ. But Paul's point here is not community. The main point is God. How do we learn about him? Through his word. How do we perceive his glory? Primarily through the church. The body of Christ is the fullness of God, Ephesians 1.23. And the most visible manifestation of God's glory, Ephesians 3.10. And so describing community in the local church is like describing the light radiating from the heavenly throne. The point is not the community. The point is God. Community is merely the effect. And because the glory of God is the aim of our community, this type of community can only come from God. 
Church community must be supernatural. And supernatural just means that God is working outside of the natural laws of this world. Something that is supernatural cannot be explained by the natural processes of this world. The only explanation for these things is God. You remember uh, Peter and John went before the council in Acts 4. Verse Verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated, common men. They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So they had no explanation for what they were doing except for God. If community in our local church is not dependent on God's supernatural spirit for its lifeblood, it is not evidently supernatural. And if it is not evidently supernatural, it is a counterfeit community. It is posing as biblical community, but it fails to accomplish its purpose. It fails to show off the wisdom of God to the world. So where does supernatural community come from? And what does it look like? Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 42 through 47. That's where we're going to spend the rest of our time together. In Acts chapter 2, we read about God's supernatural work displayed in and through the church. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 And they, meaning the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In this passage, we see the ordinary means that God uses to display His supernatural work in and through the church. That work produces a supernatural community. We see that the early church devoted themselves to four things in verse 42. Four things. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. So they devoted themselves, again, to four things. The apostles' teaching, Fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. These four things are what God used and is still using to display His glory and to grow His church. If we are going to be devoted to these things like the early church, we must be physically present with the people of God just like they were. The apostles taught the whole counsel of God and the church came together and listened. The church prayed together and lived life together. Notice the effect of this supernatural community in verses 43 through 47. So they're doing these four things. They're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. And now, verse 43, And awe, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the same pattern that we see throughout the book of Acts. When the gospel was first preached in a region... It was followed by miraculous signs. 
We see that in Acts 8, 6, Acts 8, 9, 35, Acts 9, 42, uh, chapter 13, verse 12, 14, 3, and then 14, 11. So we see these miraculous signs happen, and then the church grows, and people are being saved. But I want us to notice two things here from this passage. The first thing I want us to notice is the impact that Christians living life together had on the watching world. First thing I want us to notice. The second thing that I want us to look at is how this pattern actually changes later on in Luke's narrative. So the first thing, the impact Christians living life together had on people watching. We see that the awe that came upon people in verse 43 and the favor that they gained with people in verse 47 were not a result of miraculous signs. If you read that text, you see that it was changed lives of Christians seen through their devotion to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to prayer that actually caused awe to come upon the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We see growth happening daily, not just when the apostles preached on the Lord's Day, The people watching were seeing the love that Christians had for one another, and it led them to believe. Look at verses 44 uh, through 46. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, what we see is that the love of these Christians, the love that they had for one another, was an overflow of the love that they had for Jesus Christ. So that was the first thing, the impact that these Christians living life together had on the watching world around them. The second thing I want us to notice is how this pattern actually changes as Luke continues to write about these cities where this gospel was first preached. Jamie Dunlop is helpful here. He gives us some insight into this change. Once local churches exist, the report of miraculous signs stop. Instead, Luke limits his writing to two topics, the further preaching of the gospel and the strengthening of the church. We, say that, we see that in Acts 8.25, Acts 9.31, 14.22, 16.4, 18.23, and 20, verse 2. Those are the corresponding passages to the, to the ones I originally read where that gospel was first preached in those regions. So he continues, These miraculous signs were a temporary means of confirming the gospel. Temporary, that is, until the permanent miraculous means of confirmation was up and running. The local church. When the gospel first enters a region, the Spirit enables miraculous signs. Once the gospel takes root, the Spirit enables miraculous community. You hear what he's saying? That true gospel-revealing community is more miraculous than signs and wonders. Gospel preaching produces local churches, and supernatural community makes the gospel visible to the watching world. This was true in the early church, and this is true for us today. The church in Acts devoted themselves to the Word of God and to one another. The local church was central in the lives of these Christians. And it was the focal point of much of their energy, ambition. We see that day by day they were together. They loved one another. They lived life together. They knew that this was the most basic, the most fundamental mark of the Christian life. Love. Jesus said to his disciples in John 13, 34, and 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How will the world know that we're, that we're Jesus' disciples? By our love for one another. These Christians met together because of that love. Conrad Emboy is very helpful here. He says, it needs to be said that being committed to the church's stated meetings is not legalism. It can be, 
but it is not necessarily the case. It is legalism if we are committed only because of pressure from outside or simply because it is what leaders of the church say we must do. However, it is not legalism if we want to be there primarily, primarily because we love Christ by loving his bride. That was what was happening in the church in Acts 2. They were in love with their Savior. And their love for him flowed into love for his church. They wanted to hear about Jesus through the preaching of the apostles. They wanted to meet with other believers. They wanted to pray together and see Jesus' power work in their own day. That was not legalism. It was an outflow and an overflow of their love for Christ and his bride. So brothers, is that you? Do you want to hear about Jesus through the preaching of God's word? Do you want to meet with other believers and live life with them? Do you want to pray together and see Jesus' power work in our own day? God is calling us to a community in the local church that is defined by a togetherness and a commitment to one another. A love that transcends all natural bonds. We are called to a life together that is founded on and sustained by our love for Jesus Christ. This is the type of community that we're called to. That's what church community is. And so there are two aspects of church community in particular that have the power to display this more clearly. And we're going to dive into both of those later on today. So what we'll see in session two is the supernatural depth of community, our commitment to one another. And then in session three, we're going to look at the supernatural breadth of community. That's going to be our commonality in Jesus Christ. And then in our last session on Saturday morning, we will be putting everything together and looking at fostering a culture of spiritually intentional relationships in our church. So the local church, brothers, God meant to put on display for his glory. The local church exists primarily to display God's glory to the watching world. There's many facets to the local church, many things that the local church does and is called to do, but primarily, primarily, we are meant to display the gospel through our unity and through our togetherness because of who we are in Jesus Christ. Let's pray again together. Father, we thank you for your word. God, thank you that you have ordained, that you desire to display your glory through the church. Although imperfect, although still sinners, God, you choose to use us Lord, you choose to use our unity, our togetherness, our commitment, our love for one another to display what you have done for us in the gospel. So, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for what you have done for us. Lord, thank you for your son, Lord, for his perfect life, for his death on the cross, for his resurrection and interceding for us now. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the gospel. Lord, we pray that it would unite us as a church. Lord, that it would be the very foundation of our community and our friendships. In Jesus' name, amen.